Stand unworthy of the price you pay for me. Even when I fall, your love paid it all. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Oh, I know I get weak, but in you. Good morning and welcome. Happy Resurrection Day. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Today's a great day to be here. It's a great day to praise the Lord. I'm just excited about what God wants to do today. For uh, we serve a risen Savior. Amen. Amen. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. 
Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Amen. Let's worship him today. He is so worthy. Amen. God of heaven, living in me, gentle Savior, closest friend, 
Father, we're just so thankful and grateful for the gift that you have given to us, Lord. We're so thankful, Jesus, that you paid the price for our sin, that you died on that cross, and three days later, you rose again. Oh, blessed be your name, Lord. As we lift you up today, Lord God, we pray that you will lift up all of those out there who are hurting and in need, Lord, who need a touch from you, God. Lift them up today and touch them, Lord God. Oh, we just praise you, Lord. We praise you. We worship you, God. Be lifted high.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Oh, boy, if they don't get you stirred up and happy, nothing's going to get you stirred up and happy. <laughs> He's alive. Resurrected King has resurrected us today. Amen. Yeah, that's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be your name, Lord. Blessed be your name. Lift you high. Oh, 
great power in exalting the king. Because when we lift him up, he lifts us up. And he is glorious and awesome and loving and kind and merciful. And he loves each and every one of us in this room. So when we sing this last song, I just want to encourage you to really enter in, to lift him up today. If you need to be lifted up today, lift him up. Don't let anybody around you distract you. Or don't let fear stand in the way. Just let it go and let it out. Worship the King. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. <laughs>
talking about years ago, it just seems like our society has changed a little bit. The little girls and little boys would have little suits on and they would wear their little dresses, you know, a little yellow and pastel and they had their little, their Bible in their basket, their little, uh, all the different things. And um, sometimes I just long for those days. And we just, we just did some special things. Amen. Amen. As they're passing out communion, let's prepare our hearts. Andy's going to lead us this morning.
you know, if any of this seems weird to you today, it's just God's holy people praising him. And God is worthy to be praised. And he is uh, amazing and glorious and awesome. You know, we use that word awesome a lot, but really nothing can compare to God <coughs> and his awesome power and his love that he has for each one of us. Um, today we're going to take communion and I'm just going to talk a little bit about it. And, uh, I like I like taking communion. It's, it's a time when we can really reflect and uh, a time when we can really focus on the Lord. So as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus today, we're going to also celebrate in the communion that we have with him. But before I get started, before we get started in the bread and the cup, I just want to talk a little bit about communion and a little bit about what the Bible says about communion um, in regards to our own condition and conditions that the Bible puts forth. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 32. I might not go all the way to 32. We'll see. Um, this is where Paul is talking to the Corinthians about the Lord's uh, Supper and taking communion. It says in verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he, get, he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Amen. Communion is a time when we come individually or corporately as a body to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us when he saved us from our sins. But I want you to realize that communion is more than just eating a piece of bread and drinking a little bit of juice or wine or whatever. But it also has spiritual implications in our life. It's not just a, a rehearsed thing that we just come up and we eat, we drink, we go back. But I think what Paul is trying to say is that he wants more than just that for us when we come to communion. It's very similar to being baptized. You know, when we're baptized, we take a step of faith and we walk out and we proclaim to everybody, hey, I'm a new person in Christ. I'm being cleansed by what he did. It's like that. It's an active confession of our faith. We are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. We are telling everyone who sees us that we believe Christ has redeemed us and will one day return to finish what he started. He's coming back for us one day. So when we partake in communion, we are proclaiming that we are laying hold of all of the benefits of Jesus Christ's full redemption for our lives. Forgiveness, wholeness, strength, health, and sufficiency. We're proclaiming that when we come and we partake of the broken body of Jesus and the blood that he spilled. His promises is that we get all of those things. And that's what we're proclaiming. That's what I want you to see this morning. It's not just remembering, but it's knowing that we are redeemed 
and we have all of the promises of God. Amen. Amen. When we come to the table of the Lord to eat the bread and drink the cup, we are believing and testifying in the sufficiency of Christ to redeem us and to fulfill all of his promises. We are saying that we serve a faithful God who blesses us and cares for us. Amen. You see where I'm going with this? I want this to mean more than just eating and drinking. And I think when Paul was talking to the Corinthians, he wanted them to see more than just eating and drinking. He wanted it to be spiritual as well as physical. And I want you to know that God loves each and every one of us in this room. And wherever you may be watching, God loves you. And we can see that when we look at the sac when we look at the sacrifice that he made when he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. God loves us with an everlasting love. And he wants to bless us says in Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you says the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope he loves us each one of us God's love for us is unchanging and unconditional no matter what we do he will always love us no matter what if you're here today and you think, I've just done too much. I've been too bad, too evil, too wrong. I've just, I've gone over the edge. Well, I have to tell you today that you're wrong. God is the God of second chances. And he wants to give you a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and as many chances as you need before you say yes to him and give your life to him. And so when we come, I believe, as Paul said, we need to examine ourselves. So it's important to examine ourselves before we come and take communion. We are warned not to come in an unworthy manner. And he doesn't mean that we have to examine ourselves to see if we're worthy, because none of us are worthy, right? We've all sinned and fallen short. But what we need to do is examine our heart before we come to the Lord. We need to examine our attitudes and our mindsets and the things that can separate us from God. Sin separates us from God. The word of God says that all people are sinners and have fallen short of the glory of God. And no man has lived without sin except Jesus Christ. Our spiritual condition is important to God. He cares about where we are and what we do. I want to read one of my favorite verses. I don't know why it is. It just is. But Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So it's telling us here that it's our responsibility to come before God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. And how do we do that? Well, it's easy. We repent. We ask God to cleanse us. The blood of Jesus will cleanse us as white as snow. But if we don't do those things, then we don't come as a holy living sacrifice clean before God. And that's why every time we do communion, we always give you a few minutes to examine yourself, to confess, to repent, and to come before him as that living sacrifice. God has called us, his chosen people, that's you, to a life separated from this world. I just read that in Romans. A life of dedication and purity. The Lord commands us, be holy as I am holy. His desire is that we put him first. 
to surrender our lives to his command, to love, cherish, and adore him with all that we are. You know, the first commandment says that we're to put God first. We'll have no other gods above him. And to love him with all that we are. Jesus says that to love God with all of your your mind, your heart, your strength, everything that you are. And I believe if we do that, we're good. Because the Bible says, if you love me, you will obey me. They go hand in hand. So it's a good thing to think about when you're examining yourself. Lord, have I been obedient to you? And that will tell you how much you love God. Amen. But you know what? God loves you more than you love him. So he has given you the opportunity to grow in that and to be free of that. So now when we partake, in communion, let us remember the price that Jesus paid for our freedom. Let us come with humility, with confession and worship, and be strengthened in Him. Amen. So let's just take a minute. Let's examine ourselves and just think, Lord, is there anything in me, anything at all, God, that I need to lay down? Unforgiveness, bitterness, any kind of sin. And then just give it to him. Just repent, confess, and repent. give you praise. Let's give him praise this morning. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I miss people coming up to the altar to take communion. It's a different experience when you get to come up, but know that God loves you, that uh, what you did out there is good too. Amen. Trust God. Hallelujah. Happy Resurrection Sunday. This is the greatest day for all Christians around the world. You guys know that, right? This is the happiest time for every Christian. Because if he hadn't raised from the dead, we would none of us would be here. So praise God. Hallelujah. All right. I'd just like to uh, welcome uh, our guests, our visitors, our ECC family that's back in the house today. So welcome you guys. Give yourselves a big hand for making it out this morning. Glad to have you. Hope you enjoyed the donuts and the coffee and all that. So praise God. 
Okay, just a couple of announcements on uh, Tuesday night at 7.30. Uh, tune into Facebook uh, Live, uh, the ECC Friends and Family page, uh, and uh, for a word of encouragement. Uh, so Tuesday night, 7.30, Facebook Live, ECC fa Friends and Family page. Uh, let's see, next Sunday, the Mission Sundays, Pastor Glenn, I know he's got a great word he's preparing for us, so you don't want to miss uh, the service next Sunday. Uh, our April calendars are available out here. Uh, also, our three-month ministry schedules for those involved in ministry. Make sure you pick one of those up so you don't miss your scheduled ministry days. And also, these lilies right down here, these are available for the taking, one per family on your way out, so make sure they get a good home, okay? <laughs> you don't leave them here in the church for the next uh, week or so. So, uh, praise God. I uh, just want to encourage everybody to be faithful with your tithes and your giving, uh, whether you're giving uh, in person or you're, available, you're able to give online now through the uh, Elsinore Christian Center uh, uh, page. Uh, so, please avail yourself of that. It's pretty easy to do. So, uh, please be faithful with your giving. So, with that, I think we're going to stand. We're going to bring our blessings to the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. I know you guys are happy about that. <laughs> Everybody's got their tax money back already. Everybody's got their, their taxes paid, whichever may apply. <laughs> Your stimulus is, uh, is in the mail or it's here already. So praise God that he continues to meet our needs. So take your offering, whatever it is, hold it up to the Lord, and I'm just going to go ahead and uh, pray a blessing. Uh, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we just ask you to bless the finances represented here this morning, Father. And those out there watching at home, Lord, we just ask, Lord, for a financial blessing for every single person, Father, of Elsinore Christian Center, friends, family, and everybody watching out there, we just pray for an increase, increase, increase in 2021. And, Father, as we are faithful with our giving, Father, with our missions giving, with our tithes, Lord, giving towards our building, all the things that keeps your church moving forward, Father, we just ask you to multiply everything we sow into your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Regular ties and options will go over here in this basket. Missions giving, you're giving, go right here in that box. Hallelujah. And Sunday school kids, come on up here. We're going to have junior high, high school today also. So kids, come on up. So it's a great day in the Lord. Now, don't sit over here, guys. Come over here. Stand over here. All right, hallelujah. Now you coming to church? Now you coming to Sunday school? We haven't had Sunday school for the junior high, high school for so long. We forgot what we got to do. Stand over here. Stand over there. Right by Jacob. All right. So, look at all these kids that are back in church today. This is awesome. This we like to see. So, parents, get your kids back to church. We're waiting for you. Like I said. Uh, let me encourage you guys, the shots are available 50 and over now, okay? I went my the stadium, yeah, Friday, piece of cake. Register online, get it smooth right through. On the 15th, it's open up for 16 years and above for everybody, too. So, everybody, encourage you guys to get your shots. You guys don't get one, shucks. Not yet. So, extend your hands towards our kids, Lord. Lord, we thank you for our young people, Father. Just ask blessings on them, Father. Even they adjust for this difficult school year. And, Lord, through the rest of this year, Father, we just ask blessings on our young people, Lord. Blessings on our time in Sunday school today. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wait. Okay, wait. I didn't get a picture of it. Okay, look over here, Pastor Mike. Okay. Okay, when I say three, say Happy Resurrection Sunday. Okay, one, two, three. Happy Resurrection Sunday. All right, off we go to Sunday school. Junior high, high school, we're having class today.
praise the Lord. Good to see everyone this morning. It's good to see all of you. And if you haven't been here, as has been mentioned, you can go on Facebook and watch it. And you can go on YouTube and watch Elsinore Christian Center, the services. And there's people that are watching even this morning. Thank God for technology and all those things. But I, I long again where people will feel that they can go back to church and... Uh, I believe that day is getting sooner that we get back into going personally. Amen. Amen. We thank you, Lord. I want to share with you today about the empty tomb as a gift. The empty tomb is a gift. And I hope you brought your Bible today and uh, has been shared by the worship team and uh, Andy and Pastor Mike. This is a day of rejoicing. This is a day of Christians all around the world. Whatever time zone that they're using are celebrating God's mercy, God's love, that Jesus is risen. And I wrote this down, and it just bears repeating again. Jesus is risen. Jesus is alive. Jesus is king. And Jesus is Lord. And those are personal things that we should feel from our heart. Some might question this morning, and it's always been a subject to question for the last several thousand years is, well, we don't know when Jesus was born, they're right, and we don't know when he uh, was crucified and three days later came out of the tomb, they're right. We have some general ideas of the time of the season, but it's very interesting that science has even proven to us, you know, on the day that Jesus was crucified, there was an earthquake. And that's recorded by historians that day, a a earthquake right there in Israel in those hours that Jesus was on the cross. The Bible also says that uh, at noon till 3 o'clock that there was darkness all over the earth. And they have recorded that in history that they don't know why at noon till 3 o'clock there was a deep darkness that came all over the earth. Well, those were signs the earthquake, and also the darkness that came, that God was saying something even through nature about this event, about Jesus' death and his resurrection. And, and you can prove this through history. They have written it down through historians that these events actually happened. The main point that I would leave you with this morning is we don't know the day, the time, but that's not the point. Both of those events, his birth, and also his death and resurrection, that we observe that time. We laugh that the, even the United States government recognizes Christmas. And everyone goes, yay, I get a day off. Paid day off. But we know that the, the main thing is that we acknowledge it. We acknowledge both of those times, whatever day it was. And I want to say this to you, the two most important dates in human history is Jesus' birth, and Jesus' death and resurrection. That is the most important dates for all of mankind because God chose those days for his redemptive plan to be revealed to man. I want to read to you from uh, John, the 20th chapter. And I'm going to read the whole chapter because there are some stories in there. We're not going to get to all of them this morning. But if you'll stand with me, I just feel like we need to read this this morning, standing together. If you would, please. Hope you have your Bible. The John, the 20th chapter, verses 1 to 31. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark (coughs) and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloth lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. 
Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw, and look what it says, and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have lain him, laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the, that week, or the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them again and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. And he said to them, And unless I see, the, and has, see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your hand, reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Verse 30. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen? Amen. You can be seated. As I said, we read this whole chapter. We're not going to look at everything, but just some parts of it. This portion of the Bible is one of four of biographies about Jesus. Four gospel. Gospel means good news. And it's important that you, if you're a believer, you're a person of faith, that you know these stories. I hope that you've read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because each one of them will be different and they add something to the big picture of what happened at his crucifixion and his resurrection. Eyewitness. And each eyewitness had their own slant. It'd be like if three people were standing here and I asked three people, tell me what you see. Three people would come up with something different about what they're seeing. And God did that pur purposely that we can see the story. I encourage you to read all four witnesses. Jesus appeared to Mary and, and the other women, the Gospels say, and said, go tell his disciples that you've seen the Lord and that he was going ahead of you to the mountain in Galilee that he told you about when he was alive. And we must see this morning the courage of Mary and as we read in the Gospels, the other women that came 
even bringing spices, knowing it was after Passover. We need to look at their courage in the midst of disappointment and pain. Looking at these women's courage in the midst of disappointment and pain, they came to worship by anointing Jesus' body. And I even asked the question, who's going to roll a stone away? You can find that in one of the other Gospels. So the stone is rolled away, and they're wondering what in the world has happened. It was a big stone. It was heavy. Who had rolled the stone away? It was early in the morning. How did they do it? Why did they do it? Question. The two disciples, John and Peter, ran when they heard the news that they had seen the Lord. And yet if you read the other script, other parts of the scripture, it took quite a bit because they thought that the women that told them, these faithful women at the tomb that were full of faith and courage, they thought that they were speaking nonsense, that Jesus was alive, even though Jesus had told them. How many of you ladies would think that husbands have to be told over and over again because they forget? And the ladies are going, shall I say yes, he's right? <laughs> Peter and John ran. Could it be true? Looking inside, John outran Peter. John identified himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. An empty tomb, grave clothes, and yet there was a napkin folded that went over Jesus' face when his body was crucified, his body wrapped in linen, laid inside the tomb, and yet there was a a cloth put over his face. They call it the face cloth. It was folded up, not just laying there like the other clothes. It was folded up. Why was the cloth folded up, the face top cloth folded up? Let me tell you, in Middle East culture, when you sat down to eat, when a person was done eating, like the master of the house, he would just throw his napkin on the plate like what we do. We, you know, paper napkin or whatever. We just, you know, toss it away and just walk away. But if the person who was eating took his napkin and folded it, this is what he's saying to those who were serving him. Get, get ready. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Not only to eat at the table, but Jesus' body was resurrected he left it took the time to fold it up and he's basically saying to those disciples and he's saying to you and i today i'm coming back hallelujah have you ever heard this before i'm coming back i'm coming back the disciples, John and Peter, they looked in and they saw and they believed. Why didn't they believe when Jesus told them over and over again? Because let me tell you why. This is something that if we'll be honest with every one of us, because human beings have hard hearts. People's heart can become hard, even with the things that God tells us over and over again. And so finally, John looked inside the tomb and thought, well, there's the body's gone, the cloth is folded, the stone's rolled away. Mary said that she'd seen the Lord, that he must rise again. And then they, the Bible says they remembered his words. My brothers and sisters, let me tell you this. It's so important that you know this book. It's so important that you know the history and the stories that we're talking about this morning because you need to know the stories. Why? So you can believe. So you can believe, even though you've heard it over and over and over again. You know what? And I'll be the first one to say, we human beings are kind of dense. God, tell me again. I'm not getting it. Can anybody relate this morning? The angels asked Mary, a question, woman, why are you weeping? And she said, they've taken away my Lord. Where did they put his body? They thought he was the gardener. And Jesus is standing there for this moment. 
asking her the same question, why are you weeping? Why was Mary weeping? She was weeping because of her love for her master, that what she had seen on the cross and him being dead and those three days in the tomb, missing her Lord and her master, not having all the answers. Let me tell you something. We don't have all the answers. Jesus said to her, like the angel said, who are you seeking? Why are you weeping? They knew the answer because she was grieving inside because Jesus wasn't there. That even in his death, she called him, my Lord, my Lord. Who are you seeking? Jesus' personal response to her, as we've read this morning. Jesus' personal appearance to her. Why did Jesus appear to her even though he had disguised himself? See, that's one of the things you've got to understand is that even in, in uh, uh, Luke 24, Jesus disguised himself in his resurrected body. He disguised himself. She couldn't recognize who he was. She didn't recognize him until he decided to reveal himself to her. That's very important that we understand that. God wants to reveal himself to all of us in the right time. I believe this morning he would appear to us again and reveal himself. Jesus' personal appearance to her. He appeared to her because she loved much and he honored her faith. He honored her devotion to him. Let me say this to all of you sitting here this morning, you that are watching. If you will seek God and honor God, God will appear to you and speak to you and show himself to you. Are you talking about the Lord just coming right here in a physical manifestation? Probably not. But he's going to speak to you through his word. He's going to speak to you to your conscience. He's going to speak to you in your heart because you're seeking him. He honored her faith. He honored her devotion. He will honor your faith today. He'll honor your believing. He will make sure he makes himself real to you if you'll believe it. The Bible says, I will be found by those who seek me, who want for me, who search for me. These stories we're reading this morning, why was it that we're excited this morning. Why is it that we are excited and we're full of joy? Let me just talk about a couple of them this morning. Why do we celebrate and rejoice? For the Christian, what does this mean to us this morning? First of all, Jesus declared to them and to us this morning that I'm alive. I'm not dead. I'm alive. Yesterday, Matt and I were down here doing a couple things, and he's got the yard looking really spiffy out there. If you got a donut and some coffee today, he was working on that, and I was down here doing something. And I get a text message from my cousin in Colorado Springs, and she sends me a message in my text, a text message to me that my 85-year-old uncle, my last, the last living member of my mom's tribe, getting ready to go to church there outside of Atlanta, him and his wife. He gets into the car and has a massive heart attack, and he's gone. That was even God's merciful mercy that he wasn't even driving when this happened. 85 years old, loved the Lord all of his life. Like that, gone. We don't know about tomorrow. But we have today. But I just tell you this, whether I, I, in my sleep or the Lord to take us that quickly is the way to go. But that was in God's mercy that my uncle went home to be with Jesus yesterday. On his way to church. Now he's re really having church. He's having church with his new body, with the master that he loved and served all of his life. Jesus said, I'm alive. Death could not hold me. Death could not hold Jesus in that tomb. He is alive. He said, I've conquered death and I've conquered the grave. I tore down, listen to this this morning, 
I tore down the wall of separation between man and God. What, what are you talking about, the wall of separation? You and I, because of what happened in the garden, every one of us has a DNA called sin and separation from God. And Jesus, when he went to the cross, when he came out of that grave, he basically said, I have tore down that wall where there is no wall anymore. The wall between God and man, I have bridged the gap. I paid the price so man could have a relationship with God. He also said this, devil, you didn't win. Devil, you did not win. You thought when you inspired those people to have me crucified, mutilate my body, and to put me on the cross and kill me and kill my body that you had won. We're rid of him. Gone. He's dead. He's buried. Devil, you didn't win. Death didn't win. The grave didn't win. Hallelujah. And that's why we rejoice this morning. That's why we rejoice. Devil, you did not win. And what he says to us this morning, my, rise, my rising from death and the grave gives to everyone who will, who will believe new hope. We have new hope here this morning because he paid the price for all of us. He paid the price for every human being, but not every human being will want God's gift. My message today to you is the empty tomb is a gift. Some will intellectually say, okay, got it. But they, they don't realize that that empty tomb was a gift for them. And it's this, it's a relationship gift relationship gift that you can have a relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ to everyone who believes he gives us new hope for that relationship today and I don't know about you but I'm excited and he also said death is not the end but it's only the beginning when my uncle and people that you know and my mother back in December and my her brother the next day when my family all those family members have died and gone it wasn't the end, it's just the beginning for the believer. Yeah. Hallelujah. New hope. Death is not the end, it's only the beginning. And what Jesus was saying is, I give to every person eternal life for those who want it. I give to every person eternal life for those who want it to those who will surrender their life to me and follow me. I want to say it again. I give to every person eternal life who will surrender their life to me and follow me. He said in John 11, verses 25 and 26, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Think about those words. I'm the resurrection. I'm the one that rose from the dead. I'm the one that gives eternal life. I'm the one that raised people from the dead in my ministry. And I want to tell you this, that God, Jesus is, right, is raising people from the dead right now. And you know what raising from the dead is? It's spiritually. He'll take care of our body later in his time. But spiritually, people need to be raised from the dead. The death of their sin, the death of their rebellion. God is saying to this, I want a, I want a relationship with y'all. I want a relationship with my creation. I give to every person eternal life who will surrender their life to me and follow me because I am the resurrection and the life. And then he goes on to say, he who believes in me, though he may die. Guess what? This is not positive what I'm about to say. If Jesus doesn't come to the earth, you're all going to die. I'm dying and you're dying. You may be young and say, that's a ways off. Listen, we don't have tomorrow. We got today. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he says this to Martha. He said, do you believe this? Hallelujah. Yes, I do, Lord. Lord, I believe this, that you're the resurrection and the life. And so I'm going to die. I'm going to live. And I'll never die again. He told the disciples, and he speaks to us today, I changed my address. 
I changed my address from the earth and saying the earth is not my home. Heaven is my home. You have a choice to make a decision about what your address is going to be. The earth, and die in the earth, and stand before God with our soul, which is eternal. Well, where do you want to make your home? I plan on making my home, and I have made my home heaven. For me, it's just a matter of hours, days, and weeks, and months, and I'll be there. How about you this morning? How about you this morning? Jesus changed his address from the earth to heaven. Because the Bible says this. Peter said it. Paul said it. Your body that you are, we're in right now, it's just a tent. It's a tent. It's temporary. It's temporary. It's weak. It's sickly. It gets old. It's temporary. But the glorified body, hear this. And Jesus modeled it to us. The glorified body is eternal. You get to walk through walls. You get to fly. You get to eat. There's no wrinkles. There's, your hair never turns white. It doesn't fall out. A glorified body. See, Jesus didn't completely turn on the eternal body that he had when he came out of the tomb. He was still pretty recognizable even though he disguised himself to in Luke 24 and then also to Mary. But I tell you what he had. He had scars. He had scars on his hand. Scars on his head from the thorns. The spear that went into his ribs and Thomas had to see and Jesus showed him his hands with the scars. And I, we, it doesn't mention it, but he's also got the scars on his back. I wonder when we go to heaven, we'll, we'll come up to Jesus and say, Lord, can I see again your hands, your side? Jesus has a resurrected body, but I wonder if they'll be left to show all of us for eternity, this is what I paid for for you. Let me tell you about your glorified body, brothers and sisters. 1 Corinthians 15, very clear description. You don't age. You don't die. There's no tears. There's no pain. There's no wrinkles. You have a glorified body. Yeah, and you can fly, and you can all the things that God has for us. You know what it is? It's the glorified body that I believe that Adam and Eve had. Because, see, they started going downhill after the garden. Adam and Eve could have lived forever. But Jesus has a glorified body. You want a little inkling of what it was like on the transfiguration on the mountain where James, John, Peter <clears throat> went up with Jesus, and the Bible says that his whole countenance changed. He glistened. His clothes were whiter than anybody that could ever whiten them on the earth. His whole body changed. They couldn't even look at him. I mean, it was just something else. Our bodies, our glorified bodies, hear me this morning, our glorified bodies are going to shine. They're going to be in another realm that God has for the Christian. That is the realm of glory, like Jesus' body. First John says that we're going to have a body like him. The Bible says we're going to see him like he is, for we shall be like him. I'm looking forward to it. Ladies, are you looking forward to it? Men, we don't care. I just want to just be young. And Jesus said, I paid for you to be forgiven. I paid for you to have new life. And let me just say this also about this glorified body. 1 Corinthians 2.9, let me just quote it to you. And this is a quoting from Isaiah 64, 4 and um, Isaiah 65, 17. This is what Paul said to Corinthians that Andy was talking about that church a minute ago. Let me just say this before I read it. You can't comprehend what God has for his children. Look at the screen. But it is written, 
Eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for those who love him. Look at that. Your eye hasn't seen it, your ear hasn't heard it, and you haven't imagined it, and you have no idea. The things that God has prepared for those who love him. How's that for heaven and surprises? God's gift came out of that empty tomb. Eternal life that starts. Let me just say this. If you're a Christian and I'm a Christian, I've got eternal life living inside of me right now. I've got eternal life. When I said yes to Jesus Christ, eternal life started right then. So if my heart stops, I, 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 just, I just change address. Change body, change address. That's what's going to happen. Eternal life that starts when we say yes to Jesus Christ because he is the only way to God. So, saint of God, as we close this morning, Jesus won. And because Jesus won, we won. You ought to get happy about that. He won. You won. Hallelujah. To you who don't know him, if you're here today and you don't know the Lord as your Savior, he offers an invitation. The invitation is, believe that he is the Savior. Believe that he can forgive you of your sins. He's the only one that can forgive you of your sins. And he's the only one that can write your name in heaven's book. Believe that he will give you eternal life and life now if you'll say yes. And I want to say this to you. You cannot earn the gift that came out of the tomb. The gift can only be received by faith. The gift can only be received by you seeing your condition and asking God to forgive you of your sins and receiving heaven's gift. That's the only way. You don't do it by your looks. You don't do it by being a nice person. I've heard people say that over the years. You know, I'm a good person. I just can't believe that a loving God would send me to hell if I don't do what I'm supposed to accept Jesus as my Savior because the God I know is a good God. He, he wouldn't do that. Well, you know what? You better read it again. Because God does not send people to hell. Hear this. People send themselves because they reject his love and his gift. They reject it. And God says, Dear, you can't come to heaven except by me. We can't have a relationship except through the gift of my son. Would the worship team, would you come up, please? We're going to sing a song as we close. But I just want to say this to you. If you're not sure if you're ready to meet the Lord, let's stand together. If you're not sure you're ready to meet the Lord, today is your day. There's an invitation being offered to you. What I'm talking to you about has nothing to do with about church membership or about how many Bibles that you own. This is all about wanting a relationship with God. So if you're here today, you're not sure about your relationship with God. Right now, because Jesus called people publicly, you can read it, you would just stretch out your hand and say, you know what, just pray for me. I want to make sure that I'm ready to be right with the Lord. If that's you today, lift your hand. God is offering eternal life. God bless you. Who else would say, I publicly want Jesus Christ? God bless you. You're ready to meet the Lord. You're right. Or you don't know if you're right. Raise your hand and say, I... Join me at that prayer. God bless you. God is serious. He wants a relationship with us. And he wants you to take having a relationship with him to the relationship of rejoicing because Jesus lives and Jesus is alive and you will be with him when he determines that date. Anybody else that, you know, you've never accepted Christ as your Savior and you want to make sure today that I, am, I have a relationship with God, I'm going to turn my life over to the Lord. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. God is speaking to your heart. He's offering eternal life. Yeah, well, I'll do that in another time. I got some things I want to do. No, you don't. You got today. You don't have tomorrow. You have today. Let me just say this. For someone that's walked with Jesus for over 50 years, there's no comparison to the life that I have now. 
to the stupid person I was 17, 18 years ago, uh, when I was 17 and 18 years old. Stupid person. Drugs, alcohol, stupid. And God in his mercy saved me. But I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision to choose to be his disciple. So if you're here, make the decision that Jesus is Lord. Let's pray together. You who lifted your hand, would you lift your hands to the Lord? And let's all of us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe today that you are my Lord and my Savior. I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me from all of my sins. Through the blood of Jesus. I choose today to live for you. I choose today to be your disciple. So Lord, here's my life. You be the boss. You are the Lord. You are my king. And I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead. If you're watching on Facebook and you've made that decision, contact us at the church. We'd love to pray with you just to affirm the decision you've made. If you need a Bible, we'll get you a Bible. But God is serious, and he wants you to be serious about being his disciple. God bless you. Let's worship the Lord as we close this morning. For the cross, Lord Thank you for the price you paid Bearing all my sin and shame In love you came And gave amazing grace Thank you for this Thank you.
my God and King. And I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. And I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous work. The Lord is gracious and good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall praise you. Jesus is alive. Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord and our returning King. Amen? Our salvation is secure because we belong to Him and He belongs to us. Amen? Well, go tell somebody about how good the Lord has been to you. Go tell someone about how good God is and share your faith with people. People need to hear words of hope. Amen? Well, have a blessed resurrection day with your family or whatever you're doing. We'll see you Tuesday night, 7.30 on Elsinore Christian Center Family and Friends. Facebook will be here next Sunday and worshiping the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Hug, I wouldn't say hug one another, but give each other a, a five or a hand or whatever you're going to do. God bless you.